Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the World Through the Lens of Race Session 1 webinar. In light of the recent month's racial injustices, the UCLA Alumni Scholars Club, in partnership with the UCLA Alumni Association, decided to create a three-part program for our UCLA community. We hope this series will provide everyone in attendance a safe space from which we together can create a more tolerant and educated community, as well as celebrate the diversity of each person. Now, please allow me to introduce Bunch Coordinator Chanel, who will introduce some of the Zoom features we will be using tonight. We want to stress the fact that this is a safe space where we all respect one another's perspectives. Please feel free to leave any questions you may have during the presentation in the chat below, as we will address them at the end of the presentation. You were able to be anonymous in the chat, but we kindly ask that you remain cognizant of the words and phrases you use in your questions. Now I will introduce my fellow coordinator, Amy, as she will introduce Dr. Alexander. Dr. Alexander serves as an Associate Vice Provost for Student Diversity, is the Director of the Academic Advancement Program, and serves as an Adjunct Professor at the UCLA School of Dentistry. He has over 20 years of leadership experience at UCLA and UCSF, where he served as an Associate Dean for Student Affairs and Admission. His, prim his research primarily focuses on creating equity and access in education and the workforce, particularly for underrepresented students pursuing health professions. His work has been published in many leading educational journals, including a recent book chapter in Scholarly Engagement and Decolonization. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Alexander. Thank you for that uh, great introduction. Um, you know, my mother would be proud. My dad would probably laugh because who knows? He didn't probably think I would be what I'm doing today. But uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of this webinar for inviting me to be a part of such an important topic tonight. And I want to preface a few things before I get started with my talk, just so that you know that we're going to have a conversation. We're going to have, a, I'm going to talk to you and hopefully share some information with you that might raise awareness, enlighten you, and maybe maybe just trigger in your mind, you know, what you could be doing to help address some of the atrocities that are occurring today in our communities. Uh, first of all, the talk that I'm gonna give you is part of a course that I teach at UCLA called Ethnic and Racial Disparities in Healthcare. It's usually taught winter quarter as an honors course, which it's full right now, so don't, think about trying to get into it right now. But I also teach it as a, a topics course in Afro-Am, it's C191 in the, in the spring quarter. And the purpose and the reason behind this course is really to help healthcare providers deal with a changing population, changing population in a sense that the world is becoming more diverse, our communities are becoming more diverse. And as we become more diverse, we bring our diverse perspectives into the healthcare arena, the healthcare setting. And that works both ways from the provider to the patient and even from the uh, perspective of the, of the institution, the hospital, so the healthcare facility or the healthcare system. And so what I try to do is enlighten students and actually practitioners, I've done this for a number of practitioners to help them understand where we need to be in terms of communicating with patients with different backgrounds who come to the healthcare system with different customs and beliefs as well. So I just wanted to get that up. Um, I'm going to share a PowerPoint with you and I hope everything goes well. Let's see, um, let's see screen share. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna get started with the uh, understanding privilege and anti-racism. And I'm gonna start off by asking a series of questions. And some of those, these questions you might be able to answer. Um, others you may have to reflect upon, but the objectives that I wanna point out tonight is that number one, I wanna increase awareness of how we can ascertain our culture and ethnicity. This is something that if we're going to be anti-racist, if we're gonna interact with people from different backgrounds, and if we're gonna particularly be either care providers, service providers, and that could be anything from lawyers to physicians to business people to teachers, we have to have some sense of who we are as individuals. The other is explaining and describing structural racism. 
this is a, co a conversation we're having today in our society in terms of how racism has been so ingrained into our structures in America. And then the last point I wanna make up is the understanding of what it means to be anti-racist or be anti-racism. And you're gonna learn some more about this as part of this three-part series, but I just, wanna, I just wanna introduce it to you as we go along. So when we talk about culture, you know, ascertaining culture or ethnicity, we have to really reflect upon ourselves. And sometimes, you know, um, I would ask at some point in your life, you know, you probably were asked to identify your race on a college form or a job application or government or military form or some other official document. And most likely you were required to select from a list of rather, uh, of, of, you know, of, of uh, identities instead of responding freely. And those identities, as we know, and sometimes they, they're, there's four or five common ones, whether they're white, black, Caucasian, or Asian, for example, they tend to promote this illusion that racial categories are natural, they're objective, and they, they, they actually evidence division when you think about it. Because after all, if we, if we had Justin Timberlake or Jay-Z and Jackie Chan, and they were side by side, those common racial labels might seem to make sense. But what could be more objective and what could be more conclusive than this evidence before your very eyes when you see this? So let's talk about ascertaining of culture. So the question becomes, how do you describe your race, your culture, your ethnicity? You know, if I was to answer these questions and I'll try to go along with you, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an African-American man. I'm an African man, an American man of African descent. And my culture is from African-American uh, background. My ethnicity is also part of the African-American diaspora. And that includes African people from all over the world. So how, and now how do you describe your self-identity and does it differ from that of your parents? And some of our self-identities do differ from some of our parents, especially if we're uh, children of uh, immigrants or if we are first in our family to go to college or we've experienced a different kind of lifestyle than our parents. And so there's some difference. And, and what does that mean? And how does it help you define your culture or even your ethnicity? And if you could choose to be in, in any other ethnic identity, which would you choose and why? You know, and this is a big question that, you know, I throw out to my class, you know, during the first few, few uh, sessions, because again, we're doing some self exploration exploration and if you choose to be your own identity that's fine but if you choose to be others that's fine too i mean there must be some reason behind it and if you and if you ch choose your own identity sometimes you have to ask yourself very deeply why do you choose your own identity is there something about your identity that you enjoy or you like or maybe you're just comfortable with and what is the most positive thing you like about being in your own ethnic group you know some would say, I would say, you know, for me, it would be music. It could be food. It could be the arts. It could be clothing. I mean, there's a lot of things that we could choose within our own ethnic group that may, that may attract us or make us have a strong affinity towards that ethnic group. And then, of course, what do you like least about your own ethnic group? Um, and it, we could talk a lot of things about what we don't like about our own ethnic group. You know, for me, it could be, you know, how how we're stigmatized maybe yeah, uh, uh, in the community. And we're gonna talk about that in a moment. And then describe a time when you felt cast into a minority status. Describe a time when you felt cast into a minority status and how did this make you feel? So in other words, you know, I, I, I'll go back in ele elementary school. You know, I was, I was like tall for my, uh, for my age. So when I was in fifth grade, I was almost uh, 5'10". And, you know, I felt so out of place because I was so tall, not to mention I was, you know, black on top of that, but I was tall. And so I felt very, uh, I felt like a, a minority because it, I wasn't around the same height as everybody else. And we all have this feeling or we all, all have experienced this status at some point or another. Even more specific, think back as far as you can remember, then describe or draw on your first memory of being different. You know, what was that like? The, the first memory you had of being different. I mean, sometimes different was, a, it was a good memory. It could have been a, 
a bad me memory. It could be an indifferent memory. But there was a time that you felt different. And that difference had some effect or impact upon you. Now, when we talk about ethnic groups, what ethnic groups do you feel most comfortable with and why? You know, some people feel comfortable around, say, people of their own ethnic group. Some people might feel comfortable around multiple ethnic groups. You know, and then what I mean by comfortable, I mean just not being nervous, being able to talk freely, you know, sharing information, exchanging ideals, things of that nature. And then what ethnic groups do you feel least comfortable with and why? Because there are groups that we don't feel that comfortable with, for example. Students in my class, I'll draw upon some of their responses would say, uh, some would say they feel least comfortable around people that have a second language and that speak that language in their presence. Or some would feel least comfortable around um, African-Americans, you know, for, for one reason or another. So how do you believe your prior experience and your ethnic background help or hinder you in your day-to-day -day interactions with people? Because this is what we're really talking about, you know, our interactions with people. And as I mentioned earlier, the course that I teach, you know, whether you're a care provider or a service provider, your experience and your ethnic background can help you or can hinder you in your day-to-day -day interactions with people. And we want, we want to work on that. We want to make you feel at least comfortable. You know, you may not feel 100% uh, comfortable, but you're moving towards that spectrum of feeling you know, somewhat comfortable. And the healthcare setting, they call it cultural competency or cultural humility or cultural sensitivity. Let's talk a little bit about race. I mean, race is a concept that very few people like to talk about. We don't really like to, to talk about race. And we are having some hard discussions about race today in society. And race, as you know, race is um, one of those things that it's, it's a concept based upon arbitrary social and cultural definitions rather than biology or science. So I wanna point out that one of the biggest reasons so many people continue to believe in the existence of biological human races is that the ideal has been what we call intensely reified in the literature, the media, and culture for more than 300 years. So reification, for example, refers to this process in which an inaccurate concept or ideal is so heavily promoted and circulated among people that it begins to take on a life of its own. And over centuries, the notion of biological human races became ingrained, unquestioned, accepted, and even regarded as concrete truth. And studies of human physical and cultural variations from a scientific and anthropological perspective have allowed us to move beyond reified thinking and towards an improved understanding of the true complexity of human diversity. And not to mention the human genome, which is you science people out there, you know what I'm talking about. You know, race is this reflection that notates divisions and that are perceived sometimes to be very significant. And of course, the ideal of race, as I mentioned, has been intensely reified in literature, the media, and culture for a very, very long time. The reification of race has a long history, especially during the 18th and 19th centuries. Philosophers and scholars attempted to identify various human races. They perceived races as specific divisions of human who shared certain physical and biological features that distinguish than from other groups of humans. This historic notion of race may seem clear cut and innocent enough, but when you think about it, it quickly leads to the problem as social theorists attempted to classify people by race. So one of the most basic difficulties was the actual number of human races. So how many were there? Who were they? And what grounds distinguished them from one race to another? And despite more than three centuries of such efforts, no clear cut scientific consensus was established for a precise number of human races. Can you, can you, can you, can you beat that? I mean, I mean, we've been at this for a long time and we have not come up with a consensus to establish a precise number of human races. 
And I can go on and on. This is a whole course that you can take at UCLA or, or anywhere, actually. It's, it's a really interesting subject and topic. And the fundamental point that I'm trying to make here is that any effort to classify human populations into racial categories is just inherently arbitrary and subjective rather than scientific and objective. So what about ethnicity? You know, ethnicity, you know, the term race and ethnicity sometimes are similar and there's, there's this degree of overlap between them. The, the average person frequently uses the term race and ethnicity interchangeably as, uh, as a synonym and anthropologist, anthropologi uh, excuse me, anthropologists also recognize that race and ethnicity are also overlapping concepts. Both race and, uh, and, and ethnicity, I didn't, and, excuse me, I need some water. So both, both race, oh, okay, that's better. So both race and ethnic identity draw on an identification with others based on common ancestry or shared cultural tra traits. As I mentioned earlier, race is a social construct, you know, whereas ethnicity, we get into claim, you know, to distinct identities based upon cultural characteristics and the shared ancestry that are believed to give its members this unique sense of peoplehood or heritage. So an ethnic group, on the other hand, claims a distinct identity, okay, as I mentioned. The cultural characteristics used to identify ethnic groups can vary though. They can include you know, languages, they can include, uh, include religious practices or customs or holidays. We could talk about diet, uh, patterns of dress, and other markers of distinction. And in some societies, ethnic groups are geographically concentrated in particular regions, such as the Kurds in Turkey and Iraq and the Basque in the northern parts of Spain. I'm getting ahead of myself. So when we talk about race, though, race has been used, as I mentioned, to, to divide. And it's been so ingrained into our institutional structures that I want to show you how racism has really played a role in, to, in society. Structural, institutional, and systemic racism broadly refer to the system of structures that have procedures or processes that disadvantage racial minorities and particularly black people. It refers to the rules, practices, and customs once rooted in law with residual effects that reverberate throughout society, each with their own nuances. A good example of systemic racism is redlining, a system once used by banks and the real estate industry that literally outlined the neighborhoods where people of color lived in red ink. If you lived inside of the red lines, loans were considered risky and banks were less likely to give loans or even invest. The practice was banned in 1968, but the impacts live on, preventing black families from amassing wealth at the same rate as their white neighbors on the other side of that red line. Need proof? According to the Federal Reserve, the net worth of a typical white family is $171,000. That's 10 times greater than that of a black family. Homes in black neighborhoods are generally and historically worth less than white homes because the developers and businesses that make a neighborhood, well, a neighborhood, are less likely to be there. That means the tax base is lower too, which has a trickle-down effect. Less tax dollars for schools means fewer kindergarten classes, fewer qualified teachers, fewer AP classes. That leads to lower graduation rates from high school and even fewer graduates from college. This is in part caused by the school to prison pipeline that disproportionately impacts people of color. Institutional racism is more narrowly defined as the overt and covert forces blocking people of color from accessing the same opportunities as white people. Many of these children may benefit from additional educational and counseling services. Instead of getting the help they need, they're isolated, punished, or incarcerated. Once you have a criminal record, it invades all aspects of your life. Getting everything from a job to an apartment becomes that more difficult. Many people believe their communities are over-policed, presumed to be overly dangerous, but consider this. Black and brown people account for 30% of the U.S. population, but account for 43% of people killed by police and more than half of the incarcerated population. 
Institutional racism goes beyond just serving time. Something as simple as hair can be used to discriminate. Rules at school and the workplace that don't allow for dreadlocks, cornrows, and braids, they discriminate and don't take into consideration hair texture and singles out people based on their physical trait, creating rules where rules aren't needed, rules that control people of color. So, who gets to make all of these rules in society? Since America was colonized, it's been white people who've made these rules. First with slavery, then Jim Crow laws and separate but equal rules, and even creating limits on who can immigrate into the country. The term given to define that power, white privilege. It refers to white historical and contemporary advantages in access to quality education, decent jobs, a livable wage, home ownership, retirement benefits, and wealth, regardless of socioeconomic status. So as you can see, racism, you know, racism, ignore it and it won't go away. We, we really have to look at how we're going to address these, this institutional racism. And this video was just a small example of how race and racism plays into everyday life. I wanna move on to something that um, you heard the video talk to and talk of is white privilege. You know, um, race is a socially constructed concept but it is not a trivial matter when you think about it. On the other hand, one's race often has a dramatic impact on everyday life, particularly in the United States. For example, people often use race, their personal understanding of race, to predict who a person is and what a person is like in terms of personality, behavior, and other qualities. And because of this, there's this tendency to characterize others and make assumptions about them. And people can be uncomfortable or defensive when they mistake someone's background or cannot easily determine what someone is. Particularly, you find it in revealing statements such as, uh, uh, you don't look black, or you talk like a white person. You know, such statements reveal fixed notions about blackness and whiteness and what matters most are what members of each race would be like, reflecting you know, their own socially constructive and seemingly common sense understanding of the world. So let's talk a little bit about white privilege. You know, white privilege since in the 1990s, scholars and anti-racism activists have discussed white privilege as a basic feature of race as a lived experience in the United States. Peggy McIntosh, this, this, this is a, a person that you should get to know, to read about. She coined this term in a famous 1988 essay called White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, in which she identified more than two dozen accumulated unearned benefits and advantages associated with being white in, in America. There's a source for you. The benefits range from relatively minor things, such as knowing that flesh-colored band-aids would match her skin, or to major determinants of life experiences and opportunities such as being assured that she would never be asked to speak on behalf of her entire race. That has happened to me. I'm sure it happened to some people of color. You're in the class and instructor calls on you and say, well, what do you think black people would think about? Or being able to curse and get angry in public without others assuming she was acting that way because of her race. Or not having to teach her children that police officers and the general public would view them as suspicious or criminals because of their race. As I mentioned, she identified more than two dozen accumulated unearned benefits that are associated with being white and being a white person in America. You know, in 2015, MTV, I don't know if any of you had seen this, it was only five years ago, aired a documentary on white privilege, uh, simply titled White People. You might be able to YouTube it or go back and look at it online. And the purpose was to raise awareness on this issue among millennials. And in the documentary, young white Americans from various geographic, social, and class backgrounds, they discussed their, their experiences. You know, white privilege has gained significant attention and is as important tool for understanding how race is often connected to everyday experiences and opportunity. But we must remember that no group is homogenous or monolithic. Okay, white persons or white people receive varying degrees 
of privilege and social advantage. And other important characteristics such as social class, sometimes gender, sexual orientation, and disability status shapes the individual's overall lives and how they experience society. There was an urban anthropologist by the name of John Hardigan. And John Hardigan, he's written extensively about these characteristics. He, he has this book called, um, I don't know if I put it up there, I don't. He has a book called uh, Racial Situations, Class Predicaments of Whiteness in, in Detroit. He wrote it back in 1999, and it really discusses the lives of white residents in three neighborhoods in Detroit, Michigan. That varied significantly. There, there was one uh, family that was impoverished, lived in an impoverished community. It was one living in working class communities, and there was a, one living in an upper middle class community. And Hardigan revealed that social class has played a major role in shaping strikingly different identities among these white residents and how accordingly social relations between whites and blacks in the neighborhoods vary from camaraderie to companionship to conflict. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Eight Mile with Eminem, but that's one example of that, 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 that phenomenon that Hardigan is talking about. You know, if you, if you saw um, the movie Eight Mile, who was trying to be a, you know, he was trying to be a rapper. He had a lot of black friends and, you know, there was all this camaraderie with a group of black friends, but there was also some conflict with some, some black people that he had in, 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 the, in the film as well. So again, once we acknowledge this persistent racism and white privilege, the next step is to become anti-racist by actively educating ourselves and others about America's white supremacist history and speaking up when we observe racist acts and working towards eliminating racist policies and practices. And I know in this series that we're talking about today, you're gonna learn more and hear more about what it means to be anti-racist. And we must resist the instinct to co-sign racist history to yesterday. So anti-racism, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about it because as I mentioned, you'll hear more about it in the series. How to Be an Anti-Racist was a book written by Ibram X. Kendi, a very popular book, very, a book that's getting a lot of attention these days. And what uh, Kendi tried to do is speak to this term in, in the same vein as Kimberly Crenshaw. Kimberly Crenshaw, by the way, is a, is a lawyer, a professor at UCLA and Columbia Law School. And Crenshaw defines anti-racism as the active dismantling of systems privileges and everyday practices that reinforce and normalize the contemporary dimensions of white dominance. And we're beginning to see aspects of this happening or some of the aspects of um, dismantling and, and acknowledging that racism exists right now in our everyday lives. And I think if you all saw the video of George Floyd, it really, really touched to the heart of who we are as American citizens and what we need to do and how we need to be looking at these systems and dismantling some of them, in fact. So how can you be an anti-racist, you know? And again, there's gonna be some more discussion about this. Uh, one is through self-education through books or videos, podcasts, and other anti-racism resources like Kendi's book, if you wanna start off with that. Uh, having this brutal objective self-awareness and actively educating ourselves you know, like who we are, I try to have you reflect on that in the very beginning of my talk, where you had to answer a series of questions about who are you? Also books, you know, by authors such as James Baldwin, Angela Davis, Gloria Edom, Ross Gay, Audre Lorde, Amy Sherald, and Kihari Wiley. I mean, there's a number of books out there that people can read to help you understand the, this, 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 this anti-racist concept. And then this is a hard one, encourage others to be anti-racist. I mean, encourage them to understand the urgency of anti-racism. I mean, this is hard conversations right here, hard conversations. And here we are coming upon Thanksgiving. We're all gonna be, hopefully some of us will be around the family dinner table. And what is that discussion gonna be like? We're gonna talk about everything. We're gonna talk about school. We're gonna talk about jobs. We're gonna talk about what's been on television. We're gonna talk sports. But will we talk about being anti-racist, you know, with families, with friends, with colleagues, with our classmates? You know, what does that conversation look like, you know? Remember, you know, that the lives of humans are at stake when we talk about this topic of racism and being anti-racist. 
So I want to conclude my uh, remarks and then I'll leave some time for some questions uh, about structural discrimination because we saw the, 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 the first video, but I want to give you a, a kind of a, what should I say, a visual that will help you understand this hopefully a little bit better. So I hope you got a sense of what that video was trying to display to you. If you know, 1964 was the passage of the Civil Rights Act, which, which actually, when I say the passage of the Civil Rights Act, it was enforced as opposed to prior to 1964, which meant that you know the government, federal government, made sure that there were heavy sanctions to institutions for being discriminatory at the time. So again, I want to. Uh, I want to kind of go back and just mention how important it is that we begin to think about anti, being anti-racist from the standpoint of our best interactions with people 
and that uh, we begin to start thinking about how we can work with, I won't say dismantling, but reforming uh, institutions so that all of us can have a better way of living and all of us can have a better life. So I'm going to stop right there. I want to thank you for your attention and, 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 and uh, you being here tonight. I realize you, know, you could be in many other spaces and places, but you chose to be here and I applaud you for that. And I thank you for allowing me to share, share my talk with you this evening. I'm open for any questions. Um, let me see if I can stop sharing. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And um, I know we have a little bit of time left. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Dr. Alexander, thank you for that incredible presentation. Um, throughout the presentation, we've been taking note of your questions and we will start asking them as of right now. But um, before we do that, I would just like to introduce myself. Um, I'm Jeffrey and I'm one of the bunch committee coordinators who helped put on this event. Um, but with that in mind, uh, the first question is Dr. Alexander, earlier you mentioned choosing identity and someone asked, what does it mean to choose ethnic identity? Um, and the question is, how does this dis differ from cultural appropriation? That's a good question. I mean, you know, we, we, we kind of grow into the identity that we want to acquire. And a lot of us through our family and our family traditions. And, and a lot of, you know, you grow up and there's different customs, there's different, uh, um, you know, just different, different or, uh, times that your family gets together. There's certain things that you all actually practice, whether it's a religion or whatever it may be, but you acquire that and that helps shape your, your identity. And as you grow older though, sometimes you, may change your identity. One example I didn't talk about is uh, sometimes when um, the, the Korean family, there was an example of a Korean family living in an all white town, the, white, the Korean families, the, the children went to an all white school, uh, they identified themselves as Asian, but as they got older and they went to college, they began to identify themselves as Korean Americans because they had this affinity to want to know about their history, their background. And so the cultural appropriation, you know, is really when other groups or some other group wants to take on the, the culture of, of, of a group that they like, you know, that they want to be a part of. And so, but I'll leave it right there because there's a whole, there's a whole literature about that as well. Thank you, Dr. Alexander and Jeffrey for asking this, the question. My name's Amy. I'm also a coordinator for the Bunch Committee. And someone in the chat was asking, what would you say to someone who claims to be colorblind, someone who doesn't believe in racism because it has not affected them directly? How would you communicate the issue of racism to these kinds of people? You know, that's a very good question. And in our society today, I don't know, it's, it's it, you, you may, think or feel like you could be colorblind, but you, it's really not, it's really not a real concept in my, in my opinion. You know, I have to kind of qualify myself. I'm just more than uh, the Associate Vice Provost and Director of AAP. In my background, I have a background in sociology. My master's and PhDs are in sociology. And I taught uh, actually ethnic relations, race relation courses for a number of years at a variety of universities on the East Coast and Midwest and even in uh, California. And so this is a subject that I've actually been close to for a very, very long time. Um, and to be colorblind, it's to, to be somewhat, I would say ignorant, but I won't say ignorant, not in a negative sense, but ignorant from not being aware, okay? Because you may feel like, oh, I don't have any biases towards other people, but there are ways that you may not be mindful of that when you're around other people, that comes off as being somewhat uh, sometimes insensitive or sometimes uh, you're unaware of it. And so, uh, so I, don't, I, I really don't buy the concept of colorblindness. Hi, thank you so much, Dr. Alexander. My name is Chanel Najad and I am a coordinator for the Bunch Committee um, for ASC. And one question that was asked in the chat is among those that say they are not racist because they have black friends or say they root for people of color, how can racism be fought when so many races do not consider themselves racist? 
That's a very, very good question. How can racism be fought when someone doesn't consider themselves as being racist? Then, you know, I would take on the anti-racist attitude. I mean, I would help others fight against racism if, you know, if you, you don't consider yourself racist, but we do know racism exists. I just showed you two videos that illustrated that point. So, um, so I would, you know, I would counter by just saying that there's a lot we can do to become, to be anti-racist. I don't know if I answered the question. It was a really complex question. I know that. Okay, um, for the next question, Dr. Alexander, um, someone asked, uh, I think I heard the video mention black and brown people who are included in brown people racially. Well, the, the video, you know, it's, 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 uh, as you can see, it was a character of identities, particularly the last video and brown people could represent a, a spectrum of people. It could be, you know, Latinos, Chicanos, it could be East Asian, it could be uh, African Americans, even uh, it could be uh, Persian people, but it's really kind of identifying people based upon the complexion of their skin and not necessarily, you know, all the time their ethnicity, but you can be anywhere in America and sometimes the complexion of your skin could be misconstrued. So for example, Persian people sometimes could be misconstrued as a, a Latino Chicano person. One of my students uh, who was actually East Indian was pulled over in Westwood, and I hate to say this, but he got pulled over in Westwood and they thought he was Chicano and he wasn't. And he felt really, really bad because they misidentified himself. So, you know, brown, the brown diaspora is pretty, pretty wide and pretty, pretty, uh, pretty large as well. Thank you, Dr. A. Our next question comes from an attendee who asks, do you have any suggestions for talking about racism with people who tend to believe it as a problem of yesterday? Yeah, I would have my, that's a good question. And the suggestion, I mean, we don't have to go too far to experience racism or see how racism has taken an impact on communities. You know, um, one of the things that one of my, my colleague of mine that teaches at UCLA does, he has a course that um, he takes students out into the community because you, you, you can actually see some of the racist structures in LA, for example. I mean, if you ever get on the bus in Westwood and take that bus from Westwood, or even further, if you can go get on the bus in Santa Monica and take that bus from Santa Monica all the way to the end of the line in East LA, and I'm talking about going down Wilshire, you'll notice the people that get on that bus and how the complexion of the people change in the communities that you go through, okay? You'll notice that. And so it's it's very evident, you know, in terms of what's out there in terms of racism. And the kind of conversations we have are ones in which, you know, you really have to get to know people. And that's all it is, it's getting to know people and getting to understand people. That's why reading, that's why having conversations, and that's why even experiencing them through uh, visiting. I mean, one of the things I do with my staff, for example, as we visit communities of color all over LA, both ethnic and racial. So we may visit a, a, an Armenian community-based organization, or we might visit the Watts Tower and get a sense of history, what that's all about. Or Homeboys Industry, another facility that is really multiracial to help us understand you know, what's going on in the community. So there's a lot people can do. To, and I would uh, you know, begin to start off with just by reading and trying to understand some of the background and the histories behind racism. The next question asks, um, a lot of my friends say affirmative action is racist. I disagree. How can I explain to them that affirmative action isn't racism in a way that they will understand? Well, if you saw that last video, I mean, that should tell you something about affirmative action, um, you know, where there's a history of people that have been here since the 1600s. And then all of a sudden those people 
who had also been here were given rights to move into society in 1964. And so where do you start to make up for, you know, the, the racism, the discrimination that occurred prior to that? Uh, so there, there's that notion. The other notion is if you understand the concept of affirmative action, it's not like giving women or minorities a, a job because they're women and minority. The whole concept behind that was if you had two like candidates or three like candidates and one of them happened to be a woman or a minority person or a person of color and a white person, based on affirmative action principles, you would consider giving that job to one of those other people for the sake of affirming you know the action of putting people or helping people move ahead in the workspace based upon histories and practices of racism and so that's where that principle came from it wasn't like the person wasn't qualified or they got the job because they were black or they were latino they got the job because they were qualified and you wanted to do something to help change the complexion of your workforce, or you wanted to move people who were qualified into a position to do the job. So that's where the concept really comes from. And I think people are really confused that a front of action is one in which you're gonna give someone black or Latino or East Asian or whatever, an edge because of their color. No, it's not like that. They also have to be qualified because otherwise that's not the principle of affirmative action. That's racism, <laughs> let me just put it that way, okay. Thank you. And then our next question comes from an attendee who's asking, is racism, is racism a purely social construct or do economic systems also contribute to structural racism? Yeah, if you saw the first video, I try to show that first video to show you how structural racism actually, actually works in terms of racism, you know, and so if you, if you, um, if you, you know, I didn't really get into the, the whole history of racism because you can go way, way back and look at the history of racism. Racism and race was a socially constructed category to really exploit people, to classify people, to put them in groups and to, you know, to, to do whatever you want to do with them. And we can, we can, we can even go beyond slavery, you know, even the slave trade, if you talk about racism, early on racism. So blacks were considered inferior. So they captured black Africans and brought them to the United States to be slaves because they felt like they didn't have uh, a culture. They didn't have, you know, the, the same values and things that other people had, but they did. I mean, they were, they were in their own country doing their own thing until, you know, the slave catchers and other African tribes actually uh, also uh, participated in the slave trade. So, and because of that, we, and if you go back even further, uh, they even tried to categorize people into what they call mongoloids, caucasoids, and other categories of race. So, you know, mongoloids uh, being Asian, caucasoids being Caucasian, negroids being people of the black race. And there were social theorists and people back in the day that were trying to do that for the sake of classifying people so that they could control them. And so it's a socially constructed concept. Because when you think about other countries, okay, when you go to Paris, so, or you go to Great Britain, they don't call themselves, uh, you know, now they call themselves Black Brits, but they call themselves British. You know, they call themselves, you know, Parisians, they call themselves Frenchmen, but they don't call themselves, in our country, we call ourselves Black, Latino, African American, Asian, you know, we, that's how we describe ourselves. But they don't do that in other countries when you go to their country. You ask them, what are they? They'll say, I'm a Frenchman. You know, they don't say I'm a black Frenchman, but now they may say it because of what is coming about in terms of anti-racism in the movement throughout the world. Um, our next question, how can we start a conversation with a family member who believes that everyone, regardless of race, has an equal playing field? And the reason some people don't excel in life is because, or is due to their lack of motivation. That's a very good question. And, um, to have a conversation with a family member, you know how I started it off, because I had a conversation with my family member, particularly an older person, is to tell me what was life like when you, they were growing up. You know, how were people viewed? You know, what, what, what kind of uh, community did you live in? Did you interact with certain people or did you stay within your own community? 
And why did you stay in your own community? What was going on at the time that kept you from moving outside of your own boundaries? So that, those kind of conversations you can have with people, particularly older people, and they'll, they'll tell you, I mean, what was going on at the time. And some of it was, you know, such that it was frightening. Some of it was that um, it was forbidden, you know? So it, 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 it was at a point where it was very difficult to have those kind of conversations with people. And so today, I mean, we can have those conversations because we see what's happening in the world, not just in the United States, but just all over the world, you know, in terms of movements and people and the migration of people. And the, the, the thing is that we have to think about is people are not gonna stop migrating. You know, people are not gonna stop immigrating to this country or any other country. And as a result, if we don't begin to learn how to get along with people or at least, you know, facilitate people's lives as they live in the United States, then it just creates chaos and confusion and conflict. And we, and, you know, we, we, we're, we're a nation of immigrants when you think about it to begin with. You know, I always tell people nobody owns this land, but the native people that were here. You know, we're, we're all, we're all uh, inhabitants from some place in the world. You know, people fled here, people were brought here, people, you know, came here because of some reason or another that they couldn't live in the country or the space that they, they actually came from. So we're all, you know, all immigrants or we're all people that fled or migrated to this great country. And so we all need to own up to being the true Americans that we, we should be. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. The next question is, how do you explain systemic racism to someone who doesn't think it exists and instead believes that there are only racist individuals? Um, that's a very good question. Again, I'll show you that little video. I mean, systemic racism, we have to go back and we have to look at the laws. We have to look at where the, what I call the lines of demarcation were throughout history for people who were allowed to advance and those who weren't allowed to advance, those who were left behind because of laws or discrimination or Jim Crow or whatever you wanna call it, all right? So that's, that's systemic. And so once it gets in there, it's hard, to, it's hard to break. That whole concept of redlining, you know, if you cannot buy a house and there's still covenants, believe it or not, in LA where people can't buy houses in certain neighborhoods, I mean, if you cannot buy a house in a certain neighborhood because you were black or you were Latino, or you were, even if you were Irish back in the day, it was very difficult for you to assimilate into the United States. And so it's, uh, it's something that we continue to, to fight. It's something that we continue to live with. And that um, we're at a moment in time though, that I believe that, you know, change is gonna come. And, and I know my host has popped up on the screen, but I want to just say this as we end is that, you know, I was part of the civil rights movement. You know, some of your parents were part of the civil rights movement as well. And we've done, we did a lot to, to march and fight and to protest and to help break down the doors. But I stood on the shoulders of other people that fought and died and voted and did all those things. But now it's a whole new generation. And, and I really feel like we're passing the torch to this generation who beginning to see that there's so, so many inequities and so in, many injustices in our systems here in the United States. And it's so, so inspiring to me that we could have this webinar tonight and that you all could participate in it. And all I have to say is that, you know, read, you know, study, learn, you know, get to understand and know the differences between yourself and others, because what you'll find out is that you'll have more similarities than you do differences. So thank you again for allowing me to be a part of this forum tonight. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. And thank you for this amazing presentation and taking the time to share all your thoughts with us. Thank you to everyone who has participated here tonight. We hope you found this presentation insightful and thought provoking. While we cannot respond to all your questions, we wanna mention that this session is only the beginning of our steps to improving our community. We hope that this conversation discussed today will continue in each of our daily lives. In our next two sessions, we will give more resources and tools to becoming anti-racist with our friends, families, and peers. Please be on the lookout for the resources discussed in the session and feel free to share with all your friends and family. Again, thank you to everyone in attendance. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your night.